someone tried breaking in the front door with a crowbar. And wow. the security was so bad, we had been complaining. They tried with a crowbar and I didn't find out till months later. And I said, you lot are mad. I said, you lot are mad. Yeah. And I'm going to show you. But guess what, we're mad dog. I'm, we're uh, mad yes, dog, that's it. Yeah. I'm going to show you how mad I am. Yeah. I thought it couldn't get worse than what I saw in my state. It did. I now stop saying it can't get any worse because it can. This month in the UK, it's Black History Month, and we want to highlight some phenomenal black men and women who are doing some incredible things here in the UK and are making black history. We want to celebrate their achievements, we want to hear their story, and of course, we want to take some phenomenal information from them. So, throughout this month, we are dedicating an extra episode to the game changers in this space. I hope you guys enjoy, I hope you guys are inspired, and I hope you guys are ready to have a motherfucking good time. Let's go. This week, we are joined by a game changer that has been the voice for many people who have been neglected by state housing. He has been featured on the BBC, ITV News and The Guardian with his no-nonsense approach to dealing with the current housing crisis and continues to tear the singlets of housing providers across the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Quajo Social Housing in the building. Thank you so much for coming to, I think, a very, very important mm. segment, a very, very important series that we created to celebrate people who are making black history. Mm. And you are definitely one of the people right now that is doing phenomenal things for our Thank community you. here in the UK. I kind of just want to start from the beginning. Mm. I want to get to know you. I mm. want to get to know where, where you're coming from. Mm. So let's start there. Let's start at in the beginning. <laughs> oh my let's God. <laughs> yeah, that far back. Yes. Um, in, in the beginning when I was just, I mean, I was working in a school, a secondary school, secondary kids. They were good though. Uh -huh. um, and I was helping to teach art and in charge of marketing. But in regards to the work that I'm doing, I basically grew up living in poor social housing. And many people that are watching, many people, whether they want to admit it or not, are able to relate, whether they were living in it directly or they know people that were, because it, it happens. People just don't talk about it. And I was living in poor housing. I mean, it, it began pretty much in a garage. So we was living in a garage. I mean, garage door, garage wow. sort of thing. And they had put breeze blocks in to separate into rooms. Um, my... Um, my shower was about the size of that cupboard back there. Like, wow. I kid you not, you couldn't step into it and you have to go straight into the shower. The water was coming through the door. There was ants, you name it, damp mold growing on the beds. And it was me, my sisters and my dad in this small garage. And I remember it was a, around the time Grenfell happened because I remember being stood there on the morning before I was going to go to sixth form, watching it on TV. And I just thought, People don't, don't care about social housing tenants. People don't care about working class individuals, people like myself, my friends and whatnot. They just don't give a damn. And I didn't, I, I, I didn't know at that point I'd be doing the work that I'm doing now, but things sort of progressed from there. And we was in there for a while and then moved into permanent house now under Clarion, who's the biggest housing provider. A lot of people will know who they are. Um, social housing provider, uh, housing association. And that house from the get-go was falling to bits, but my the dad bits. didn't want to complain. And that's a lot, like a lot of people in social housing that have moved from temporary accommodation to permanent social housing because it takes years to get there and even to get a property. What's, what's your background, may I ask? As in where my parents are? Yeah, where your parents are. So from? dad's from Ghana, mum's from Ireland. And, yeah. and um, your, is, your, is your dad an immigrant from Ghana? You're, yeah, you're like yeah. first generation yeah. here in both the UK. Both my parents are, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are both, mm. okay. So I have a question. When did you realise that your living situation wasn't the norm um, growing up? Wasn't normal. From the, pretty much from the get-go, from when you're living with mice, you know that it's, yeah. th this isn't normal. You go to, you don't want to bring your friends around. When the moment you start feeling you don't want to bring your friends around because yeah. you feel ashamed, is when you know it's not right because you go to your friend's house and whatnot and see that they're not living like this. They don't have these sorts of issues. So you think it's just you and you, in your head as a child would think, they're going to blame you first and foremost for it. They're going to think you're dirty. They're going to think that you're the problem. And it wasn't until I started growing up that I started thinking, hold on a second, I moved into this place now. We had 
I mean, the list goes on. Cockroaches, damp, mold, mice. Uh, we had a ceiling missing over Christmas. We had a kitchen. The units were nearly 100 years old. It was taken from another ha property and put in there. The security to the house was so poor. Um, our light in the bathroom was filled with water. We with had water, holes yeah. in walls. Like, it was ridiculous. I had having to go to the gym to shower because you had nowhere to use. And the security was so bad. When my dad fell ill, he, and which I'll go on to, he was, um, he was bed bound basically. And someone tried breaking in the front door with a crowbar. And wow. the security was so bad, we had been complaining. They tried with a crowbar and I didn't find out till months later. And someone came to look at the door and they said, those are crowbar, crowbar marks, someone tried breaking in. Had they walked around the back and just gone down the alleyway, they would have walked straight into the house because the back doors don't shut. And there was a brick stopping. The only thing keeping the door shut was a brick. That was it. That's um, crazy. And we had been complaining, been complaining, been complaining, and just, it completely ignored. And I knew it wasn't just me. From the outside, my estate, you can see that it's falling to pieces. It's crazy, because yeah. I, I also grew up in, a, in, a, in an estate <laughs> growing up and mirroring a lot of the things that you went through. Mm. It's things that I went through, the mould, that's all it. over, like literally, I remember because um, I I grew up in Frizzy Park, mm. so Andover Estate. Oh, okay. Um, so I literally had um, mold coming all mm. across, like it was literally from the top of the ceiling. Yeah. And I remember it, it ran all the way down, the down through. We had issues with mice as mm. well growing up. Like mm. I remember sleeping and just like you just see the mice running into the the radiator holes, mm. and you can just hear it. And you can mm. just like because I was so young, we didn't understand. And mm. but you get to understand as an adult that mm. us throwing my sh mice on the street and watching them being ran over is yeah. not normal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, but yeah. that was, that. that's all we knew. Mm. Do you feel like the people who are living in these conditions are because of them being minorities, them oh, being yeah. black? Yeah. yeah, I mean, and I've spoken to tenants that would be the same. I've said this time and time again, and my dad, I know, felt like it. he was treated he felt like he was treated the way he was because of the way he sounded, his strong African accent, his name, even phoning up to speak to them. Instead of using his uh, Ghanaian name, he will change it to his middle name, which is Robert, yeah. and use that as a way of just seeming a bit more British or to fit in or be taken more seriously. And other tenants have said the same thing. I spoke to one lady on my estate only a few weeks ago, and she says, why are they treating us like this? Whether we're black, white, at the end of the day, we still bleed the same blood. Absolutely. And no one should be living in these conditions. And this this horrible perception that in Africa, and I went to Ghana for the first time this year, there's this perception, in, and some people have said it to me on, online, they think because of my name, um, I was born, bred there, and just racist individuals saying they're, they're living in mud huts with leaves oh, and shoes and all this just uh, stereotypical nonsense, quite frankly. Um, and it's almost as if then when you do come from places like Africa and other um, developing countries, let's say, um, you you feel like that's what your their perception of you is. So you mm -hmm. almost have to fulfill that and you're lucky to have anything you have. But at the end of the day, you're a human being and it's the same way. But like, I wish if my dad was here, I'd tell him the same thing, that it doesn't matter where you're from or the fact that it's taken you five years to get social housing. At the end of the day, if the next person wouldn't live in these conditions, if they wouldn't live with mice, cockroaches, damp, mold, never mind when they're dying, then no one else, they shouldn't expect no one else to. Because at the end of the day, you're paying your rent, you're paying your bills, you're paying their wages at the end of the month, you're contributing to that. So they need to treat you as if you are. Yeah. Um, but housing's never been seen as a priority. And within social, within social housing, we have to make sure I get this right, but black and ethnic minority groups are more likely to, to um, rent in social housing than any other group. Um, and that, I mean, just speaks for, speaks for itself. I mean, there's thousands, I mean, it's, I think they said half a million people are estimated to be living in disrepair, which is in wow. conditions like that in the UK. And quite frankly, I think it's probably a lot higher than that. Um, but that's their estimate. But so it shows you how bad it's been. And it's not been happening the year that I've been going around with a with a camera in my hand and going yeah. into people's homes. Grenfell uh, residents were complaining about similar issues. They were saying they were being ignored. Nearly more than five years on, tenants are saying the same things. They're coming to me saying we are being ignored. We're not being listened to. We're not being respected, treated like human beings. Yeah. And that's what they were saying years ago. So then the question is, have lessons been learned? And I just feel like absolutely no lessons have been learned. It's an absolute shame. Honestly, this has been going on for many, many years. And I feel like the fact that Grenfell wasn't so long ago, mm. we're talking about three, four years. Mm -hmm. I lived 
in Frisby Park when I was six. So we're talking about 10 years ago. Yeah. So it's something that has always been a reoccurring problem, but it's mm. only now that mm. people like you and their platforms are being used to expose it. So mm. everyone's like, hold on a second. This is not just me that's going through this. Yeah. Many, many people are going through this, but mm. I want to ask you a question. Mm. What, how has your upbringing in those type of environments, how did it affect you at school? Oh my days, this is another thing and a very, very important issue that you bring yeah. up. Because I feel like young people and kids are the overlooked victims when it comes to housing and poor social housing in particular, because they don't have a say. Yeah. They go home to wherever it is, whether it's a garage, whether it's a shed, you name it, damp, mold, mice, they have to go home to that. And they are massively the overlooked um, victim. And it impacted me massively in school and my sisters because at the point before we were moving into the garage, I was, so I was studying my A-levels and my sister was doing her GCSEs, same year. And my council gave us the ultimatum. You either, and bearing in mind, we've grown up and lived in London our whole lives, South London. They said to us, um, you either pack up your stuff and move to Luton in your final years of studying, mm -hmm. or you move into this garage and just take it. And my dad had to take that option because we couldn't, we were studying for our exams. Our school had to try and intervene and they wouldn't even listen to them. So ultimately we were left in those conditions and were forced to suffer in silence. And that's happening to so many kids. They are the overlooked victims. I remember on Eastfield when that blew up with my yeah. situation, my estate now, when I shone a light on it, mm -hmm. I was working in the school opposite. And I was, I was walking into um, people's homes, uh, tenants' homes, just thinking I'm gonna be speaking to the tenants, then noticing one of the kids I teach sitting on the um, sofa. And this wasn't just one house, I was going to estates in the local area and bumping into kids that I teach at school. And you would never ever know that they are living in these sorts of conditions. Yeah. Why? Because they're ashamed. Parents are probably scared because they don't want their kids taken off of them. And they're worried ultimately they're gonna be blamed for it. And it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. It's massively embarrassing. Um, I was, at, when I turned to social media, that's how desperate I was because no one would do that. No one wants to admit they're living with cockroaches, never mind to thousands of people on um, social media. Internet, it's yeah. massively embarrassing, especially when the stereotype is it's your fault as a social housing tenant. How about you get off your backside and clean it when that's not the case? Mm -hmm. It really, really is it. 100%. And mirroring what you said, like, funny enough, your parent decided to stay. Mm. I was given the exact same ultimatum, mm. which is why I grew up um, in Bedford. Uh... So it, the, the decision was, the, the, the conversation now that a lot of people are having is that it's either you basically stay in the housing that you are currently um, or you move outside of London. So they're offering people in Luton and Bedford homes, bearing in mind that the Luton register for social housing is worse than the one oh, in that's London. It. That's it. So you, you have the same problem, not just in London, but outside of London. So yeah, I had to basically uproot me and my family to then move to Bedford mm. to come into a space that already had some sort of racial prejudice for me being an African woman. Mm. But those are the type of things that I had to, I had to go through because um, my living conditions weren't great. We mm. were homeless at one point. Mm. It was it was awful. But I read an interesting um, statistics um, in terms of people that grew up in social housing that they are more less likely to be successful. That's it. That that people in social housing are less likely to be successful than those who are who who did not grow up in social housing. And mm. I want to know what you feel about that. Oh, I, I completely get it. I mean that that explanation in terms of kids being an overlooked victim when it comes to poor housing and me walking into homes and bumping into young children that I've taught in schools, the basic works to try and further them, themselves in education. Now they're suffering in silence and it's translating in school as them being bad or not 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 following instructions or um, th these sorts of things, but it's not the case. It's because of their living and the, the conditions you live in have a massive, massive impact on your outlook because yeah. already being in a, an area or being from social housing, you're put at a disadvantage compared to everyone else. But 100%. the fact you're living in poor housing where you can't even go home and do your homework comfortably. I remember my house, that garage being flooded during winter, my A-level work being destroyed, my sister's GCSE work being destroyed, but the people at school didn't know. No one, no one knew, and I, I'm, I'm not surprised kids are put at a disadvantage. When you're moving from hotel to hotel, temporary accommodation to temporary accommodation, the local council is telling you, pack your stuff up, you're either moving into a shed or you're moving up to Bedford, and you have to move up to Bedford while she's also trying to study for your GCSEs. How can you not be put at a disadvantage? How are you not at a disadvantage? And this is not taken into consideration, and it's why it frustrates me so much, because it was put onto me and I was told that I didn't even know this, but um, 
I was told by my safe, my friend who was a friend of mine, but I used to work with them and they were also my teacher and they were in charge of safeguarding, that disrepair and poor housing isn't listed, it doesn't have to be listed under safeguarding as a major issue. And there's thousands of kids in Wandsworth alone, I can't remember what the statistic is, but there was one day where um, it said that there were thousands of kids, there was X amount of kids um, who, who were homeless in the borough. And I'm thinking if that's going up and, down, on, up and down the country, of course these kids are disadvantaged, but where's the support for them? They're not being listened to, they haven't got a voice, they're going back to whatever it is they have to go home to. And it is a safeguarding issue. And it's not the fault of the parents. It's the fault of the government. It's the fault of the local councils and their housing providers as landlords. 100%. It shouldn't be the case. It's the space and especially you, what you were going through with your with your father being being very ill at the time. I just want I just want you to talk to me about your thought process during those times. And what was your thought process when you decided I'm not getting help from the people who are supposed to be supporting me, my family and I have to go to social media? God, you see that whole time there. And at that time, my dad, so my dad had stage one esophageal cancer. He was diagnosed with it. Everyone was saying, oh, Quajo, we're really sorry, really sorry that um, your dad's unwell. And I thought, I thought stage one, he's found it early. He's going to be fine. Like, I don't know, it's bad cancer, but he'll be fine. Me not knowing it's a very, very aggressive form of cancer and it's of your throat. And it progressed quite rapidly. And he went from being able to eat and swallow to not being able to even swallow his saliva, never mind even drink water. For his last year, he didn't drink any water. He wasn't drinking, he was being fed through his stomach. That was it. And he was a skeleton of himself. I mean, he was bed bound in those conditions that I described in the beginning, cockroaches, mice, damp mold. He had nurses coming in three times a day to feed him in those conditions. They couldn't even bath him upstairs. That's how bad um, things were. And that became our priority when uh, cancers, Honestly, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Um, and anyone that has had it or knows anyone that has, um, knows how hard it is, even if you don't have it yourself, but watching someone have it. And he deteriorated massively. And we were complaining about mice and everything, but he was the priority in his illness and getting him better because that was our ultimate goal. And mentally, it, it messed all of us up, I think. We were even arguing with each other. Our family members were even arguing. We were just all angry. I was very, very angry at the time. And um, it progressed the stage four um and he 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 basically died so he died from the he's died from the esophageal cancer um and things then went from bad to worse i mean we had a massive leak and the part of the ceiling uh caved in and it was after he had passed away but it was the same room he was in same wow. corner everything um it partially collapsed that was in the february we reported it no one came out to take the ceiling down until the october of the year the same year october and they took down the whole ceiling. What they didn't tell us, that the ceiling was asbestos. They left dust everywhere. There was dust in the home. I took pictures and everything. Me and my sisters were still in there. I had to chase, chase, chase them. Because a workman came out with a bit of putty and he looked up and he said, they've only told me it's a small section I'm coming to fill. Why have they pulled the ceiling down? He said, make sure you go and check that it's not asbestos. Alarm bells started ringing because he said they wouldn't pull down the whole ceiling unless it's asbestos. Called them now. I said, dig, no, you need to find out. Go to the area manager and confirm. She then turned around and said, yes, it, it was an asbestos theme that came out. I said, so why is there dust all here? Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, your, your dad had esophagus cancer. Mm, yeah. And in the same room yeah. that he was staying in, mm. there's a ceiling. Mm -hmm. That contained that Artex, contained parts of asbestos. Yeah. Parts of asbestos, which yeah. causes cancer. You know what they said to that too? They said... It's fine. It's not brown or blue asbestos, which happens to be worse. But I'm like, it doesn't matter what it is. We shouldn't be here breathing. If in. it's blue, pink, Rap, green, that's like... it. Purple, orange, and they they then went and said that, and they tore the ceiling down. So here's me thinking, oh yeah, next week it's going to be back up. I said to the I said to the woman, so are you coming next week to do it? She's like, no. This was in uh, October, end of October time, beginning of November. So I said, okay, when are you coming? January, February of the following year is what they said. We didn't have a winter. Oh, I said, I'm not going to have a ceiling for Christmas. She said, no, you're not going to have a ceiling for Christmas. We've got two people that deal with ceilings and they're both busy until January, February. So they came out then. Wow. They didn't deal with the mice, cockroaches, damp mold, none of the rest. I had to get a solicitor. They were then dragging their feet with a the solicitor. There was one day they were supposed to come round and I was at school. Bearing in mind, at school now, I had my own office and I was spending more time on, I can say now because I'm not there, on time on the phone trying to ring them and get hold of them than I was doing my actual job. And they said one day, OK, we're going to come. We're actually coming. We're coming. We're coming. 8 a.m. in the morning. It gets to 10 o'clock in the morning now. No one showed up. I've gone outside on my break now. Phoned them. I was so angry and I was depressed. I was at antidepressants because my dad had passed away for severe anxiety 
and depression. I was suicidal at that point. I was mashed up and these people weren't making it any easier. I said to them, are you coming? They turned turned around and said, "Um, no, we're not coming. Um, We're really busy and put the phone down. I said to myself, that was a day I sat down and I remember the brown benches outside. I said to myself, it won't be me calling you. I promise you, I promise you on everything you will have ITV or someone ringing you. It will be a journalist calling you now because you're a disgrace and I'm going to make sure everyone knows you are. Yeah. And um, the local, I posted my house on social media so the inside, the contents of my house falling apart and it got shared on Twitter. Um, And I had Twitter at that point and everyone shared it. They were actually amazing because I was expecting backlash to be cussed out and everything, but I wasn't. Local news picked it up and it went in the newspaper. Now the housing provider, the biggest in Europe, after knowing my whole story of my dad being ill and everything, him passing away, living in those conditions, turned around and said, and I quote, where sorry Quajo feels as though he hasn't received the service him and his family deserve. And I said, you lot are mad. I said, you lot are mad. Yeah, and I'm gonna but show guess you. what, we're mad dog. I'm, we're uh, mad yeah, dog, that's it. Yeah. I'm gonna show you how mad I am. Yeah. I'm gonna show you how mad I am. I yeah. went round that same day after school, every single home on the estate by the evening, I had gone round all 500 and something homes, wow. knocked on every single door, put a letter in every single person's door. By the time I got from one end of the estate to the others, WhatsApps, emails, everything going off, WhatsApp videos coming through. People's homes, mice, cockroaches, damp, molds, missing ceilings, missing walls, all sorts, oh. leaks, active leaks, you name it, was happening across the estate. I then went and made a thread the same day and I said to myself, they think they're mad, I promise you I'm mad. I yeah. shared it, thousands of people uh, retweeted it, shared it, commented on it. That same day, ITV, or the day after ITV contacted me, three people on the same team com- contacted me about the estate and said they're coming down, so I said nothing. Two weeks they had to spend on the estate looking at everyone, like everyone's uh, doing a full investigation of wow. the conditions of people's homes. It was that bad. And it went out on ITV as a top story. Um, it went out on a top story um, on the national news. Wow. And the thing is, Clarion tried everything. I was told there was workmen showing up at people's doors when we were there filming. Just after we had finished filming, there's workmen showing up on people's doors because they had caught wind of what was going on. Yeah. It was too late. It was, it was already late. out on the news yeah. and they were nationally disgraced. They then turned around and said it was just my estate. So what did I do? I went around the rest of the estates in the area and proved that it wasn't just my estate. Then they said it was just Merton. What did I do? Went around uh, the rest of London looking at housing. But by that point, people were contacting me from other providers, not just uh, my own. Yeah. And also local authorities, just as bad. They're wicked. They are. Some of them are wicked. Um, they are contacting me from local authorities to living in. I thought it couldn't get worse than what I saw in my estate. It did. I now stopped saying it can't get any worse because it can. And there was people with stage four cancer, you name it, illnesses, living in the worst conditions. One lady, had, and I'm still in contact with her, um, stage four lung cancer, living in her property covered in damp and mold, went up to Birmingham. Every single wall and door in that property was black from damp and mold. They had been in there 10 years. Mum had had a stroke. She was blind, laying in a hospital bed in the front room. They had done nothing. I share it on social media now. Within 48 hours, you've moved them out and they've been complaining for 10 years. Wow. 10 years. And it's not just them. It's happened where people have been playing for years and years. I then share it on social media and you've got them out within 24 hours. So you can move when you want to, when you're shamed into doing it. When you're disgraced. When you're disgraced disgraced, and they've been paying their rent. It's It's, honestly... It's honestly, it's so, so disgusting. And I feel like the power that you have brought to people since you have started your brand has been absolutely incredible. I feel like the fact that, I think what's more beautiful about your story is that it started with yours. Yeah. It started with your experience and it was like, hey guys, I'm not the only one going through this shit. Mm. So somebody that is watching your story and watching your thread is like, hold on a second, this is also happening to me. Mm. And then you have this kind of domino effect of people feeling Mm. less and less ashamed to share their story. Mm. I know, I'm gonna be honest, I know if I was still in social housing and I was going through what I was going through when I grew up, I'm not saying Pim. And that's because of the shame and the embarrassment. Mm. Like you never know what is happening past those doors. Mm. And I kind of felt like, wow, like how can I be this, you know, this normal girl when, you know, I'm coming from this family where we're quite proud and we're quite, mm. you know, you know, me as a Nigerian woman, we're quite yeah, proud. that's it. We're quite, we don't want us, we don't want people to know what's happening that's within it. our house. And again, it's also something, and I'm not sure about the, in the Ghanaian community. Uh, definitely. But in our community, it's like, you don't tell people what's happening yeah, your in your business. home. You yeah. don't tell people your business. That's it, you don't tell people your it. business. So it's a very much suffer in silence, silence type of, thing. Type of community mm. that mm-hmm. I come from. 
But when I see people like you that are not only highlighting issues, but also resolves. And again, like it's amazing how you also tell you, you tell the viewer the whole story. So from the initial thread mm. to the conversations that you have mm. with the um, with the housing associations mm. and then the conversations that are being had to resolve whether that has been resolved and they've moved them out mm. or excuse me you haven't responded to this That's it. at the housing so yeah. I think it's it's absolutely yeah. incredible can I just ask you something since you've started mm. how many people do you feel like you've been in contact with in at housing. this present moment yeah in housing thousands yeah. I mean thousands. I've been to a staff client estates a hottest day of the year I remember I was up in Leeds when we had that 40 degrees I was up and down these estates I thought I was going to die no um, lifts but it's been no, d no, no lifts, lifts. Yeah. Um, we had in that one actually I think there was a lift but people are constantly up and down it um but I've been thousands from my estate to other estates in the local area to people calling me texting me um on emails but I was like I can't just pull, pull up the ladder on my situation. I could have easily just stopped after mine was in the paper and they said they were going to come out and do mm -hmm. my home. I could have just stopped. You could have stopped. But I said, I know my neighbours are and I can't, I can't sit comfortably in my house. And I know how they messed around with me. Mm -hmm. I know how that my housing officer messed around with me. And it was almost when I was com coming in and he was seeing the same things with his two eyes. He was telling me, no, there's no problem here. Then as soon as the news, his tune changed, completely changed. The I was English telling him was what you're yeah. going to do in my house, what yeah. you're going to fix. And it was like, it almost felt like the ball was finally in my court. Yeah. And now you wanted to start, we're going to dance now. We will dance and dance. That's it. That's, we and we will dance, dance <laughs> till the next day we're going to dance. And I, ever since then, I've had an attitude where it's like, fuck around and find out. Mm -hmm. sort yeah. of thing. If you want to fuck around, you're going to find out. Yeah. Um, and I've had that ever since. And that's what I try to instill within other tenants because there's this perception in this country that organisations can't be wrong. Yeah. Or you don't want to take them on because you're one individual. My housing provider happens to be the biggest in Europe. And I said, on the day they hung that phone up on me, I said, Give it a week. Give me a week. It won't just be the housing officer that knows my name. It'll be everyone from the housing officer up until the CEO. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, I've been the biggest mistake they've ever had ever yeah. since. I promise you that the CEO, even now, up until today, I haven't met her. She know you. She knows. She, she knows. know you. And that's what I want. That's the attitude that I want people to carry, especially when it comes to social issues and people suffering, mm -hmm. is fuck around and find out. Because yeah. you may be a CEO on half a million pounds, but at the end of the day, when it comes to... I mean, you should never underestimate someone that's got nothing to lose, literally has yeah, nothing to lose. That's that a, their yeah, that that's, the, the, listen, it's do or die. That's it. Never and underestimate that's that do or die. Yeah. I, was, I was at that point of two things could have happened. I would have showed up at their offices or I did it the way that I did it. And I'm so glad I did it the way that I did it. And my dad would be so proud now. So proud. Because it's managed to help so many others as a result of his, his own suffering. And I think he was probably worried at the time that he, when he passes away, and he often said it like, loads of people will show up to his funeral, but then after that, you don't hear from anyone. And it's kind of true, it is true, but his names lived on beyond the point that he would have even, even expected as a result of this. And I know he would, he would be laughing. I mean, even being shown up on BBC News and ITV News, and he, that man used to watch it every single day, even when he's sleeping, he has the news channels on. And if you want to change it, if you want to change those channels, he will wake up, he will know automatically, and then switch it back to the news. So the fact that I'm on those now, talking about, issues with housing as a result of his story, I know he'll be very proud. Moving the conversation about you as, as a person, what is your most memorable achievement since starting this thing? I know you have won mm. three awards yeah. this year. You've worked with uh, Channel 4, you've worked with IFTV2, mm. Good Morning Britain. Mm. Tell me for you, what is your most memorable and rewarding achievement? Oh, it's, it's crazy. There's... It's been nuts. It's been an absolute crazy, crazy last two years. But I think there was there's nothing more rewarding than the tenants getting moved out of their situations. Like I've been into some homes and they are horrific. Like they are beyond words. No one. It should be a complete void. No one should be living in there. That's how bad they are. And tenants have been complaining for years. In some cases, ten years. And it's then getting them that email to say, or when you've shamed the provider on on social media, and then. Uh, you get the email to say they've been moved out, we found new accommodation, permanent accommodation for them, or they've moved into their homes and they send me pictures and videos and, of them and their families in there. That's when I think that's the most satisfying thing for me, I think, because you, you feel like you've done something massive, you feel like you've changed 
their trage- like trajectory in regards to their lives and they're not have to gonna have to their kids will have to grow up continuing and they will living in those conditions they will con- they will they will they'll begin to finally be able to live their childhoods and do yeah. what it is be able to invite their friends around and just small things like that that's um the biggest achievements i think but being able to go on these shows that my dad watched and growing up it is very very surreal i mean I did an interview with Beth Rigby, who um, works for Sky. Wow. Um, and is a journalist. And I had a long sit down, longest sit down interview I've had. And it, we went in to some, yeah, just detail with my growing up and what I want to do and where it's come from. And that, that was really good. But I love going on like Good Morning Britain and ITV and BBC and Channel 4 and doing all of these things because it is very surreal. And it's not normal for someone like me. I mean, off of an estate to be able to, I would have never thought ever, ever, ever in my lifetime that I'd be sat on the other side of the television screen. Yeah. Um, so to be able to do that has been, yeah, massive. I'm so, so proud of you. And just another question. You mentioned about the, the living conditions that some of the, the, the tenants have been placed in. I know I, I saw one of your viral videos where there was like hot water literally oh, yeah. falling from the ceiling. Mm. Off the top of your head, what is the most shocking experience mm. have you had to date? I'll give you three. Okay. One, I'll leave the worst till last, actually. The hot water videos were bad. I mean, when the central heating burst and people's homes were flooded, because there was one tenant that actually was burnt as a result of that, trying to escape the property. Wow. And she's got life-changing burns now on her feet as a result. Wow. Um, That was horrific. That was really, really, really bad. And two properties were affected as a result on that estate. Um on that night, but it had happened multiple times before that. Another is when I peeled back a child's mattress and hundreds of cockroaches came out. Mum told me she had found one a couple of days ago in her ear. Um, and then finally is being stood myself in someone's home, inch and a half deep in raw sewage shit, basically, um, from the neighbors. And I mean, it was raw sewage to the point that was de- the uh, undigested sweet corn floating around. That's how bad it was in their bedroom, everything. I mean, it was ridiculous. Those are the sort of circumstances that just completely left me speechless and I've wow. seen some stuff. I think one thing I love about you is just even what you represent, like you as a black man, not a black man in a suit, mm. a black man that can come in ITV in a do-rag mm. and let people know. Oh, I like know. to be comfortable. Yes, <laughs> yes. I like to tell people how to do their yes. jobs in a tracksuit. You know, there's some people that when you now come into these uh, right. mainstream spaces, mm. they want to um, adhere to yeah. that space. You're like, listen, I am a black man. Mm. I am I am a man from South London mm. and you go know about me today. Yeah. Whether that's in a do-rag, whether that's in a hoodie, mm. whether that's in a bomber jacket, mm. whether that's in a Nike shoe, mm. Name it, Vapor you Maxis, are gonna, you, Air Forces. Yeah, I am going to educate you yeah. in the motherfucking Air Forces. Yeah, and I mean, I could have easily, and at some point, I, depending on the work that I do, I probably mm-hmm. would have had, I will have to change what I'm wearing. But I came into this not to dress up and accommodate or make anyone else feel comfortable. I'm here to tell people in a profession that has paid thousands of pounds that they are failing at their jobs. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to dress a certain way to make them feel comfortable. What matters is what it is that I'm saying. Mm-hmm and how people are being affected, not what I'm wearing. So whether I'm in a tracksuit, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing. As long as I've got clothes on my body, you shouldn't be worrying about that. All you yeah. need to be worried about is what I'm saying and the issue at hand. So I like to do things comfortably and I like to be comfortable. And that's why I always am relaxed and dressed down. Not that I can't dress up, but I'd, I, it's it's not my thing. I'm not here to impress anyone. I'm not here to be in a suit or fit in or blend in. Listen, we've got Westminster full of people in dresses and suits, yet we've got campaigners like myself telling them that things are going wrong and not working and ultimately telling them they are failing at their jobs yeah whether i'm in a tracksuit or not that doesn't matter it's the, the problem the at, fact. that's yep. it and it's a problem at hand i shouldn't be here having to do it but i am and if i'm going to do it i'm going to do it comfortably do you know what i love you like i don't you don't understand how like you how you represent the people right now. Honestly, mm. I am so in admiration of you. And you were also doing this. You just graduated from Leicester. Yeah. How did you manage to balance having the the weight yeah. of so many people and also being in education? I promise you, the only thing that carried me through that had to be God and God only because mm-hmm. from when in my final year and I nearly dropped out of university three times when my dad was diagnosed. Yep when he passed away and also in my final year, because in my final year, I was having to travel up to Leicester three times a week by coach. 
and sometimes it was just for an hour and come back down. My travel time per day was about seven hours to get to and from my house wow. and back again. And I, on my way up there and in my lectures, I'm having, I can't even concentrate. I'm having to send emails to MPs. I'm having to send emails to councillors, tenants, um, looking at videos that are being sent into me or having to do all of this campaigning work while I'm, I'm not even listening to what my lecturer is saying or my seminar teacher. I can't even take that in. Hmm. And my final year was massively, <laughs> sounds bad, but winged. I was using my student loan to carry me around the place. And I thought, I, I genuinely thought I'm going to have to reset the year because there's no way I could have passed. I'm, I don't know how, but managed to get a 2-1 and I was so happy with that. I was, I was just glad that I got it out of the way because there was three times I was convinced I wasn't doing uni. I'm done. I'm finished. I'm, I'm not here for this sort of stress. But I managed to do it. And with all the campaign and work on top, I don't know how. I'm glad I've got my graduation in January. Yeah, but, um, it's a great... Yeah. You wait. That's it. That's we it. love the educated That's black man. Hello, hi. I better fit this big head, but we'll wait. It, it will. It yeah. will. You better wave that. I have one more question for Go you. On. I keep looking at you mm. and I keep seeing heavy is the head that wears the crown. Mm. Heavy is the head that wears the crown. Mm. With all the people mm. that I would say you are carrying on your back mm. right now, mm -hmm. how are you dealing with that emotionally? The pressure of having all these people who essentially rely on you yeah. for answers. How are you dealing with that? It's hard and I, I can't, I've, I've come to the realization in the beginning, it was very much a thing that I was having to stay up every single hour until I got every single email and I helped absolutely everyone. Now I'm getting, I, I've lost count of the amount of messages and DMs I could show you. I will be here for the next half an hour, me scrolling through my DM request. I can't, it's impossible for me to answer all of them as much as I want to, but ultimately I think now for me to help as many people as possible, change needs to come from the top level at government. Mm -hmm. And I'm still very much rooted in helping individuals and going to people's homes and helping them and trying to get them out of the worst sorts of situations. But it's impossible for me as one individual to, to help absolutely everyone. I mean, it's thousands. I think the, the, estimate, uh, the estimates that have been put out there, the people, the amount of people living in disrepair, I think is wrong. I think it's way higher. Yeah. You know, things are normally minimised to make it Minimized. not look just like, as bad just as Just like it. they said how many people passed away in Grenfell, right. like 30 people, right. that's bullshit. Right, 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 yeah. right. I think they said 72, but then there's talk around all of that. Yeah. Um, but it's exactly, it's, I mean, it's exactly like, it's exactly like that and I can't help everyone. And it's hard sometimes, it is. Sometimes it's stressful and sometimes there's been times where I think, can I actually do it? Yeah. Or there's been situations where there have been loads of black backlash where you get dragged and whatnot for the work that you're doing and mm -hmm. you're like, why, like, should I just stop now? Like, let someone else take take it up and, and, and continue it. Um, but then I, th I remember why it is that I went in, into it and I remember that, um, what it was like for my dad and that there's gonna be many, many people out there in similar situations suffering and no human being should be. If we wouldn't let animals live in those conditions, if animals and bats dogs and cats home, have better conditions than what social housing tenants have, there's a problem. And I need to continue doing the work that I'm doing. And until change comes from the government, I don't see myself stopping. Stop whether that's him. a year from now, whether that's 10 years from now, whether it's 15 from years from now, I'm gonna still be banging on about the same issues until it comes. Cause there's no one, and I mean absolutely no one in Westminster, not even Liz Trust, Kwasi Kwarteng, yeah. or any of them sat up in that building would turn around and say to me, they will live in any of the conditions that I've highlighted. So my point is that no one should be living in those conditions and they need to create policies, legislation, regulation to stop that from happening. But we've seen today, and I've been highlighting it for two years, we're seeing potential for that to be rolled back now, even after all of that. So- it, Let's move on to yeah. that because honestly, I think one of the reasons that I, I felt like this, this conversation was so important- See that alcohol's even going me, I'm just even thinking about stressing me out, I'm like- Honestly, let's get into it. I am, um, a dummy. Mm. I'm going to be honest. And, right. I'm, and I'm not afraid to say that. There are certain elements in this life that mm. I have no clue about. Mm. Politics is one of them. Mm. The social housing crisis is something that is very, pa I'm passionate about. But because of the intricacies of the legislations and governments, mm. I need somebody with intellect and knowledge. Mm. For me and for many other people who are passionate about our people, mm. but might not, the, might not know the intricacies mm. to explain currently. Mm. In Westminster, what is going on? <laughs> What's happening in the House of Commons? What's happening in the <laughs> House of Commons, Chair? So basically, 
um, don't quote me on this, but post Grenfell, there was talk about regulation needed to prevent Grenfell from essentially happening again and yeah. landlords getting away with allowing tenants to live in poor poor conditions. And it started, I mean, it pretty much started. It was high. Grenfell was the catalyst, as sad as it is, was the catalyst for that change. And we were made promises that change would come, better regulation would come. This wouldn't ever be allowed to happen again. Mm -hmm. And we remember what it was like when politicians were lying in the streets after Grenfell to give their condolences, say how sorry they were, say this cannot happen again. And that's been going on since it happened and it's progressed ever um, ever since. And what was supposed to happen, so what year are we in now? We're in 2022. Earlier in the year, we had the, the Queen's speech. And what has happened up until that point is that regulation has been looked at and potential regulation anyway, and negotiated, changed. And I met with, so did Grenfell United, Shelter and other groups and met with um, politicians. Michael Gove was yeah. the housing secretary at um, the time. The he was the first one that I met anyway. Yeah. And we were speaking to him about what needs to change from a tenant's perspective not from a politician's perspective, because a lot of them, I would say, they probably don't live in social housing, any of them. Yeah. And so we were given insight from our perspective, what we think would work, what we think needs to change. And majority of it was cost effective. It wouldn't cost them a lot at all. Mm -hmm. But it was clear that regulation was a massive issue and something and culture that needs to change within social housing in particular because tre tenants ultimately are treated like shit in this country yeah that is that is what it is they're looked down upon in this this stereotype this benefit street stereotype that's completely rubbish um of social housing tenants and they bring nothing or do nothing which is just um wrong and they're suffering in extremely extremely bad conditions i mean you can look back 20 30 years from now and see documentaries of tenants being blamed for damper mold just like yeah. they are now yeah you can go and see that that's all online and what this regulation was going to do was give tenants more powers it was going to prevent tenants from living in absolutely slum conditions especially in 2020 um to great to, britain great yeah. britain um, it was going to give, I don't know if I mentioned tenants, more a voice. It was going to give the regulator and ombudsman um, who you can complain to if you're having issues, more powers. So they were given more powers to go in and inspect landlords and make sure they're doing what they're doing. Almost like Ofsted. You know how Ofsted go into secondary schools yes. or primary schools to check that the schools are doing what it is that they're supposed to be yeah. doing and then rate them based on now or intervene if necessary. All of this sort of stuff was supposed to be brought in with this legislation. Now, this legislation was announced in the Queen's speech earlier in the year. So we all thought, this is great. It's going through. It's going to help tenants massively. It's going to help people living in disrepair, poor conditions, especially after Grenfell. This is going to be the defining moment of change that has happened as a result of that. Um, and today, what we've seen is the there's potential. They haven't officially announced it, but it's been leaked and it's out there that they're planning on shelving that. So instead of sending it through and making sure all of that could happen, like regulation being tightened, like tenants giving a voice, um, uh, all of these sorts of things that are going to benefit social housing tenants and stop this from continuing, the housing crisis in that sense anyway, from continuing, we've seen them put them, this talk they're going to put on a shelf and push it to the side sort of thing. Wow. So we don't know when that could go through. Now that's going to be disastrous for housing um, in, as, a, as a sector anyway, because social housing is such a, a big part and we we depend it doesn't matter whether you're a mortgage holder it doesn't matter whether you're a private tenant you will depend on social housing if everything goes tits up yeah with housing and if there's a massive crisis or a crash and you can't afford to rent privately you're then going to turn turns to social housing what we're seeing is there's not enough social housing there's over a million people on the waiting, on the waiting list for list, social yeah. housing there's people being housed in sheds garages storage units you name it because there's not enough and it's in substandard conditions people living in slum conditions we haven't got enough of that and it's not being focused on and what we're seeing now is changes to that has now been potentially shelved and pushed to the side so it's not being seen as a priority and we don't know when change is going to come as a result yeah i don't know what more we can show them people living with sewage in their homes what more can we show even, you even where i've i've seen conversations where my friend has told me um, that she's been on the waiting list for the past 10 years. Yeah. And she's in a uh, two-bedroom house. Yeah. And there are seven of them living right. in... Right, overcrowding, two, oh, massive got, issue. Um, overcrowding with mm. people. I feel like what is the... My question is, what is the benefits 
for the government to prevent these things from happening? Is it that they're trying to be cost effective? Is it that they are trying, is it that these landlords are essentially these, uh, obviously, the, I'm, I'm assuming the landlords you mean are these people who are the, who own the social housing, right? Yes, yeah, so yes, these are, yeah. These are, these the are companies also, the that companies own, yeah, that or the councils, landlords. the individual councils that manage the homes. Is it a benefit to them mm -hmm. not to put these things forward? Um, I, I've, I have a lot of questions. I mean, for so for for the landlords, for, so if this regulation didn't go through, for the landlords, they say that they want it to go through because it then um, it will make things. Uh, that will set a standard when it comes to social housing in this country and it will yeah. set a standard for them to follow. On the other hand, if it didn't go through, they wouldn't have to change anything. Like, why change something if they don't have to or they're yeah. not being told to? So they could essentially continue doing what they're doing and they won't get nothing other than a slap on the wrist, right? And for the government, um, it will cost them. It will cost them to, to make these changes, no doubt. And local authorities are asking for more funding in order to make sure they can carry out repairs and build more social housing. Um, but housing's not really in this country being seen as uh, desirable, I don't think, by the government, especially for the last few decades, because of money, like you, a lot of these ideas and policies that they, 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 they normally come up with anyway, there's some sort of financial incentive there. But for social housing, there isn't really. You're yeah. being asked to build um, thousands of homes per year for social housing tenants um, to, to be in. And yes, they're paying rent to the landlords and whatnot, but it's not making them millions or billions or adding to the economy in that sense. Yeah. So that's why I believe it's not been seen as a priority other than after the Second World War, when there was a massive drive for, I think it was something like three decades to build um, social homes. And a lot of the social homes are still around up until today. That's what we've been seeing. However, in the 80s, social homes, the right to buy scheme, I don't know if you've heard of it, yes. was introduced. So um, people, tenants could buy their housing association. I think it was just housing association properties at the time. And that was under Margaret Thatcher. So people did. Mm -hmm. But there was a promise that the homes would be replaced. The homes were never replaced. So now what we have is we have an almost deficit in, in of properties, social housing properties. And what's happening is they're not building at the rate that people are demanding the properties to. So mm -hmm. we're seeing demand for social homes increase, whereas we've not got enough and they're not building enough quality social homes. Yeah. So what happens then? We end up with a million people waiting to get into social homes. And it's not being seen as a priority. It's not something they want to deal with. It's not an issue. They don't want to have to build a million homes. Do you know how much that w that is going to set them back on because why yeah. because they're not having to live in those conditions they're not having to live in temporary accommodation i mean i talk about um i talk about a lot especially in westminster um what's it called um so in westminster we talk about or in workplaces but in westminster and the house of commons in particular there's a big push on diversity you can see it we oh, see in the home office we see we've got an asian diversity. lady in charge diversity the Chancellor's a black, I think he's Ghanaian. I'm sure he's Ghanaian, yeah, Ghanaian Kwasi, name. Kwasi, that's Kwasi. it, that's it. Ghanaian yeah. man, we've got loads of people of colour on the front benches now. That's all good and well. We think diversity, diversity, tick box, tick box, tick box. Yeah. But then you start digging. What about class diversity? Where are the people that are living wow. um, in estates? Where are the people that represent them? Where are the people from working class backgrounds? Where mm -hmm. are all these people? that are, are suffering from your policies. Your policies aren't informed yet. They're gonna have to be living in those bad accommodations. They're gonna be having to suffer moving from hotel to hotel because there's not enough social homes. Where are those people? There's no yeah. class. There's it, Honestly, you're absolutely right. It's interesting because you have people who would tick the box in front face mm. for diversity, but behind the scenes, you can tell that they don't really understand the culture. Right. I, I watched a um, video. Up. Yes, you show, <laughs> show those tests. <laughs> Um, I watched a video of a MP. Mm. She is a uh, uh, Indian. She's uh, Asian, but her parents are from Kenya or oh, something like Suella this. Braverman. Suella Braverman. The new she, home yes, secretary. Yes, the new home secretary. Mm. Please excuse me. I do want to say my politics knowledge is not the no, best. No, don't worry. Don't but worry. But I'm here to be educated mm. as, as many other people. And I watched her and um, she was like, yeah, my dad was from Kenya. Mm. Kenya. Mm. And I was like, you can't even... It, it shows how detached you are from, mm. from that culture that you are trying to uh, mm. be involved in because mm. you can't even say the word right. You mm. can't even say... I've never heard someone from Kenya mm. get the wording of their country wrong. Mm. So yes, by face value, mm. you might be black, you might mm. be Asian. Token gesture. 
Yeah. But that, that's exactly what it is. So congestion. That is exactly what it is. So you you have people like you say that don't that don't understand mm. um, what is actually happening happening to the majority of their culture, mm. and they come from the minority who yeah. are brought up in middle class, upper class mm. to represent the people mm. who are really going through it and there's that disconnect. Mm. How can somebody that ha ha has had it all mm. or has had a good and secure upbringing be speaking for people who that, were struggling? You don't represent You, you don't can't. Represent you I can't. Mean, it's like um, the way I, I, I try to put it anyway, especially when it comes to um, the Home Secretary, because obviously we had Pretty Patel before. Yes. But I could sit here now. I could be Prime Minister. And I could say I came up with a Rwanda policy and I was someone that was white and I made someone um, home secretary that was also white. They would be accused of racism mm -hmm. from the get go yeah. because of that. But now I'm prime minister. I'm going to say, do you know what? I want this Rwanda policy. I want to send them immigrants over there, but I don't want to be accused of racism. Do you know what? I'm going to get that black person over there, stick them in charge. And then we can't be accused of racism. Yeah. They can't accuse us no more because we've ticked diversity boxes. That's not the case. Your mm -hmm. policies are still racist and discriminatory yeah. because it's affecting a minority group that you do not represent. You don't represent. And just because you're a brown woman, you don't represent them. Yeah. And it is racist. You can claim that it's not racist because of the color of your skin and it's not discriminatory, but yes, it is because you're sending in a minority. You're dis she said the other day, I don't know if you saw it, but there was a video that was put out and she was smiling. She said, I'd be so happy to see um, across the Telegraph, I think it was, which, in the newspaper, the plane leave from Heathrow with immigrants on and go off to Rwanda. Something along the line, she said that. And I'm thinking, you, you have to be a, a sort of different human being. Human being to, you have to, to say be that. Some, another sort of evil to say something like that. There's doing your job and then there's being wicked. Being wicked. And that's wickedness. And, 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 and it really ties back to what you're saying, that it, it stuff like that is excusable because of the colour of her skin. Right, it's a token gesture. Yeah, because if a white woman was to say that, it would be carnage, mm -hmm. but it, it's less accepted because it's like, well, she's talking about her yeah. own people, mm -hmm. so she, she's mm -hmm. all right. Do you know what I mean? But, but it's, it's not. You're not. You don't not, represent them. You don't We've represent a, them. You've had a, a, a very good upbringing. You've gone to, I don't know, if she, I'm pretty sure she went to private school. You yeah. went to your private school, you had your upbringing, you had your money and whatnot. These people coming over here don't have that luxury. Yeah. A lot of them are desperate because they're fleeing war or fleeing persecution and they're looking for a safe place to come. Now, we can say as individuals, we didn't ask what country we were born in. We didn't ask to be born in Great Britain. And had we been born in a country where it was war-torn or... Over here, there was persecution and this country was completely war torn. There's no doubt we would flee to the next safe place to go mm -hmm. to. Any human being would. And we need to look beyond borders and people's skin colour and see people for human, for beings, human beings and their situations. And not send them on to be further persecuted or mistreated or, or disrupt their lives anymore. I think it's absolutely disgusting. There's a lot of people in Westminster, there's a lot of people in the Conservative Party that all have brains. I'm sure they can come up with a different idea, one that's less discriminatory mm -hmm. and damn right racist um, to deal with immigration. I, I, I think a bunch of year eight kids could. Um, but they're, they're not choosing to do so. And it's very, yeah. very frustrating because ultimately it affects the lives of other human beings. And I just think, I don't know if I'm just on a completely different planet, but I just think it's, it's just absolutely disgusting. I think from what the conversation that we're having, I feel like that you are, uh, emp you're such an empathetic person. Mm. So you can think about things that don't, necessarily affect you but as a human yeah you can understand for example things like uh, uh, things like immigration mm. you were born in this country yeah that's not something that is um directly yeah. i didn't um, have to you didn't have to you, you know what I mean? somewhere, but yeah. as a human as having a father who was an immigrant and things like that you are able to empathize with those people and saying regardless of me i've got i mean i've got my red passport yeah. but these are still human beings that need to be yeah. Um, that need to be adhered to and need to be helped. Mm. I think a lot of times when you're looking at people um, in politics and they come from these uh, middle class, upper class background, the laws and legislations, as long as it helps them and helps yeah. their communities yeah. and helps their pals who mm. own multi-billion dollar businesses, billion mm. pound businesses, that's all that matters. Mm. They are the landlords 
the, the, they are their friends are the landlords that we are trying to right. stop. Mm -hmm. They're they're the ones that are doing clink clink mm -hmm. with these big uh, corporations and these big social housing and keeping them people, afloat. And yeah, their interests afloat that are affecting the people who are going through the things that you see on mm -hmm. an everyday basis. I think if we were to have more empathy towards one another, regardless of how much the situation affects us or doesn't affect us, I feel like we'd go, we'd, we'd be better in the yeah. long run. But I would love personally to see someone like you getting into politics. I was gonna just say, um, now I'd love to see people that are more representative. I'd love to see boys and girls off of estates yeah. go into politics, those that represent uh, the majority in, in in the UK, people from disadvantaged backgrounds, people of colour that are from working class backgrounds. You. In, well, I mean, I, don't, I haven't made a decision yet. I have to, I'm going to have to wait and see because it's, it's, it is the state of it at the moment and the way I'm stressed out from outside. But ultimately, I think I have to, if you want to create change, sometimes you have to do it from within. And as yeah. much as I want to stay outside of that, and I never ever intended, my path was never to go down to um, politics route. My path was never to sit in the House of Commons or Westminster. It never has been that. But from what I've seen is if you don't go out there and you don't vote, if you're not in with the crowd making decisions, if you're, if you're, if you're not a part of dictating what is happening, then all you are is someone that's gonna to have to follow whatever decisions are made. Yeah. So that's why I think it's so important. As much as people say when it comes to voting, oh, why am I gonna vote? Like, what's the point of voting? The same thing happens, then none of them care about us. And to an extent, I absolutely get it because I don't think any party's really getting it or nailing it on the head at the moment when it comes to the real issues people are having to deal with. But if you want to change to really happen, you, 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 have, to go, you have to go out there, you have to vote, you have to make sure your voice is heard. Even if it's in a small way, you need to influence that because there's worse and there's worse. What you don't want is worse, so sometimes you have to vote for worse and push for even better. And it takes individuals, hopefully like from my story, it takes individuals and your voice is equally as important as mine or anyone else sat in Westminster. Um, so to create that change, we're gonna need more people like you, like me, off of the estate, from social housing, from working class backgrounds, going in there and making sure they represent, they represent the people or the younger version of themselves, yeah, the, the, what they would have liked to see in, in, in Parliament and in Westminster. That's, that's the jobs they need to be doing. And I really do hope we encourage in schools and whatnot, young people to, to take that on and feel like they do belong there because absolutely they do just because they don't go to private school in Eton and whatnot doesn't mean their voices don't matter or they're not as educated because yes okay you might have not gone to Eton but they don't have lived experience I can tell you that for free yeah. I can tell you that for free they don't have the lived experience and I think that's more important than anything you anything else you could have yeah and again I feel like it's so important for us as a community to be educated on these things. Mm. Like, honestly, I I grew up in a place where um, things like politics, mm. things like the conversations that we were having are not being taught in mm. our schools. Mm. And it's very interesting because when I talk to people who are like from middle class, upper class mm. backgrounds, they can tell you about all these things. Mm. People that are my age, your age, they they have those conversations mm. about politics. They have those conversations about, they know this this party and that party and that party and this party. I don't feel like it's it's purposely mm. done in our community to restrict us from that knowledge yeah. because knowledge is power. Mm. And I feel like these are the things that affect our community. And the more that we don't know about it, the more that it's painted where, oh, we shouldn't vote or oh, voting, what's the point? Oh, yeah. just vote whoever come. When we have that um, thing instilled into us, the more that they can try and run us around. Yeah. So I feel like, these conversations are so important. Education is so important. Yeah. I feel like in in the um, education system, mm. it should politics should be something that is vital. Like yeah. especially when I was growing up in school. I don't know if you if you learned politics in school. No, never. I didn't learn politics in school. I it wasn't didn't an know. option. It no. wasn't an option. What? Who's Tony Blair? Who's right. David Cameron? Yeah, all of who's this these people? Our lives as adults. And Literally, it will continue to to the moment we die. It, it will. affects our lives and the processes. I couldn't tell you what Labour does or this and that. It's only in my adult years that I'm like, hold on a second. I need to know about these things yeah. because guess what? The people who know about these things, the people who have the knowledge mm. are the ones that are creating loopholes mm. to then work around the yeah. law and legislations mm. to, to, benefit, to, to benefit themselves. Mm. So really, 
we are the only losers here mm. because the people who make the rules are the ones that break the rules. And then when we're saying, oh, we're not going out to vote because what's the point? Well, then you're just feeding into that and yeah. you're going to have to suffer whatever decisions are being made by others that just don't get it. Yeah. And I think that's why, especially with the next election, there's a huge push with voting because we're very much underestimated. The people off of the states, the young people, the young black boys and girls, the young people of colour um, off of the states, working class individuals, no matter your colour, are very, very underestimated when it comes to politics and whether or not they're going to vote. It's like, oh, they're not going to vote for us anyway. Why do we need to do anything? And I think it's about showing them that actually our voice does matter. And if we need to stand up and we need to vote and we need to make it clear and put our foot down, then we will do that. And I think the next election's the perfect, the perfect time to do that, to show that actually you should be listening to us and you will be listening to us because ultimately, you, in two years' time, if we have an election in two years' time, if not before that, you're going to come around and knock on my door begging for my vote. But what have you done for me? Mm -hmm. What have you done for me? What are you going to do for me if I elect you as an individual? What are you going to do? You're going to make false promises and not follow through with it? Or are you actually going to create real change that will benefit us, benefit the people on their estates, mm -hmm. benefit those that are suffering from the cost of living crisis an energy crisis what are you going to do for us don't ask what you're going to get from me and you want my vote because then after that it's all good and well when I vote for you and elect you and then you disappear but you're in for four years or however long it's going to be five years and I haven't done anything right, I haven't, you haven't done anything you haven't done anything and that's why it's important for um, for, for people to, to, to vote and demand answers from them mm -hmm. and not just false promises we want clear answers we're not yep. stupid we're not born in a barn yep. that's the assumption we're not we're not, and it really, really frustrates me. That's why it's so, so important. As much as I get why people are disenfranchised and don't want to vote, because it's a complete mess at the moment. We've seen it and how it's affecting people. So like, everyone's like, what's the point? I completely get that. I had that attitude too. Mm -hmm. But if you don't, someone else will, and it will benefit them. Yep. That's why I think it's so important. And I think highlighting what you said about people feel like their vote doesn't matter. Mm. I feel like everybody that's watching this should take your story mm. as one individual. Mm and conquered a big corporation, a mm. big, is that what they would call it? Would they yeah, call social, yeah. a big social housing company mm. and take that, that if one person can beat this social housing company, mm. I think a group of us could beat the UK. Yeah. And that's and that's how I'm going to set the precedent that's now it. moving we, forward. There's, I think when it comes to the UK um, and the economy, we look at the economy and we look at, um, the way in which it works and we look at working class individuals and the classes, the working class are the backbone of this. We, everyone goes out and works, but we go out tirelessly and do the jobs that others yeah, won't. won't do, yeah. We work hard to keep it going. We, we keep it running. We look at our NHS, we look at our education, we look at our teachers, doctors, nurses, we look at um, housing officers and whatnot. They are the ones that keep, people that work in Tesco, people that work in Asda, Morrisons, you name it. These are the people that are keeping everything going. But what is it that they're getting? Why is it they're not, not treated in a way that, post, post men and post women, why are they not treated in a way that makes them feel as though they matter? Make them feel as though they are the backbone of this economy? Why are they just shunned um, and looked down upon? That shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. It really, really shouldn't. We look at the pay of the NHS workers, how they were the backbone during the global pandemic, how they saved this country. And what, how, did we, how did we treat them? What did we do for them? We gave them we a, round of, a round, of, round of applause on the we, doorstep, we banging pots and pans. That's all they got. It's a massive slap in the face. It really is a it slap is, in the it face. Is a, it is so patronising. So, so patronising. What are we really giving them? They don't, worry, they don't care about you banging pots and pans on your doorstep. What they care about is being able to top up their gas and electric at the end yeah. of the week, feed their kids, put bread on the table. That's what they care about. And they're not getting it. They're having to use food banks and go to food banks. That shouldn't happen in the sixth richest country in the world. Wow. It shouldn't be happening, but it is. It's, it's absolutely insane. And even going black, I, I watched a, um, a thread on Twitter and a doctor was breaking down their salary and somebody that works, these two people that work 12 to 15 hours a mm. day for a doctor who spent, how long is it, six to eight years mm. in education to be coming home with like 2K, 3K a month mm. on the NHS. These are the mm. people who were, who were saving lives Mm. and risking their own lives while everybody hid, while mm. everybody isolated. These people came out knowing that there's a possibility On the front line, that literally. they could die. Yeah. And a lot of people did, did die. die. Yeah. A lot of people did die. A lot of doctors, a lot of nurses, a lot of care assistants mm. died in, this, mm. in, in, in the pandemic. So you're absolutely right. 
they are the backbone of our economy. Mm. And I feel like we definitely need to all stand up together mm. and start taking the politics and the government and what is what the decisions that are being made for us mm. seriously. Mm. Because you wouldn't on a normal day, if somebody said, go here, Mm. You, you will question it. Why am I going there? Yeah. What am I doing here? Mm. Sit here. Mm. What am I doing Why here? Are Why am I sitting here? here? Why am I sitting here? That is exactly how the government works. Mm. But rather than it's because it because it's at a grander st scale, you don't know that you are subconsciously sitting down when you're being told to sit down, mm. and subconsciously standing up when they're telling you to stand and up. Not asking why. And not asking any questions. That's it. You're not asking why. Why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. I don't, don't want to do this. That's it. Yeah. You're raising your voice. And I mean, they're they're just doing whatever they. And a lot of these policies are so misinformed. I mm -hmm. swear down, if I was a politician, things would change. Things would change massively because my basic common sense is like, how can you make decisions for people based on what you believe um, will will do to benefit them, or it may not necessarily benefit them, but to 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 reach a goal? Mm -hmm. how, how? Why is it that you think you have the best answer for that? without it being informed, without speaking to people that are ultimately going to have to follow your rules, jump when you, or say how high when you say mm -hmm. jump and yeah. sit down when you say sit. Mm -hmm. How are you making all of these policies when it comes to housing and everything without asking teachers, doctors and nurses how they feel about it, how it's going to affect them, whether they support the policies, whether they agree, whether changes need to happen to it in order to make it bene better, in order to benefit them more. None of these questions are being asked. You're just going out there and, like you said, telling them to sit down and expecting them to sit, jump, how high, and all of this sort of stuff. And then you're wondering why your policies are policies are failing. I mean, it, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. I don't understand how politics, how their brains work at the moment. Like, yeah. why, why, why is it that I'm seeing it, but but they're not? Is it a fact? Is it a thing that they don't care? They just want to push through what they want to push through yeah. in order to to push their own narratives. But it's going to get to a point, especially and we're seeing it with the economy at the moment, where people are getting sick and tired. I mean, last year I think it was 716 billion pounds was collected in taxes. Now we've got increases in food banks. We're seeing a cost of living crisis. We're seeing an energy crisis. We're seeing um, nurses having to, again, go to food banks and worrying about their pay, not being able to put food on their table. Can you speak to us about this cost of yeah. living crisis? Yeah. Can you just tell us like what, what that means and if it's something that could be resolved and if it's not resolved, how does that affect everyone in the UK? I mean, it's it's crazy. It is crazy, this cost of living crisis. We've seen the state of the economy at the moment mm -hmm. and the way in which it's deteriorating, but also the way in which it's affecting people. And yes, the governments say, oh, it's as a result of the war in Ukraine and with Russia and what, but it's not just that. It's a way, it's about the way the country is being run to in the economy mm -hmm. and decisions that are being made. And fundamentally, I feel like if you cared enough and it was high up enough in your agenda, it may not have be happening um, to the extent that it is happening and yeah. the way that it's happening and people being affected in the way that it's happening. I mean, we look at working class individuals, the worst off in society and the way in which they're struggling with their bills, food banks increasing, food banks worried that they're going to run out of food come winter. Yeah. People worried that they won't be able to heat their homes or they're going to have to just focus on what heat in one of their rooms in their homes because they can't afford to run their gas. Electricity prices going up. Um, all of these sorts of social issues um, increasing yet, like I said, 716 billion pounds collected last year, sixth rich richest economy in the world. Um, all of these contrasting things happening. And I, I, I believe if they cared enough and it was high up in their agenda, that people won't be being as negatively affected as they are. And yes, the war in Ukraine and with Russia is affecting that. Yeah. We, 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 can't, we can't deny that, but it's not an excuse, I don't think. You find an alternative. If we're being negatively affected as a result of that, there's always an alternative. There's always a solution that you yeah. can be fine. And it's down to you as elected individuals and politicians to find that solution. But I feel like it's just not a priority. It, it really it really is a, a dire situation. Mm. And I would say, what can people do now it, with, with this type of economy? What what can the people do? I mean, it's, it's difficult in all honesty, it is. And I mean, like you said, this housing crisis, and I've been banging on about it, this housing crisis, and I said this only a few days ago, from the work that I do has predominantly focused on um, working class individuals living in poor social housing or poor uh, private housing or private housing where you're being charged extortionate amounts of money for rent. Now yeah. what we're seeing this is progressing to the middle classes and we see that through the form of 
mortgages and the fact that interest rates are going up and now they're even worrying um, about how they're going to keep up their, their their payments or pay for mortgages or even take out their mortgages yeah. because of the that the six percent and it's not a lot like in the 19 nine, in the 90s it was around interest rates were about 12 12 to 14 percent but it's six percent at the moment but it's just as damaging why because wages don't um, stretch as much. Yeah. Also, on top of that, what you're seeing is a cost of living crisis, an energy crisis, where bills have gone up by hundreds of, of, of pounds. But also, back in the day, in the 90s, when we're looking at mortgages, it was about, I think on average, you were paying... For it to take out a mortgage, it will be like double or triple um, what you're bringing in. So say, £57,000 I saw, I think, was around the average in the, in the, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, that someone would need to take out. Now people are taking out 10, 11, 12 times what they're earning in order to get a mortgage. And if they can't afford that, if they cannot afford that, then what happens when they start um, uh, d defaulting on payments and you yeah. have your homes taken off of you? Well, you're going to go to private sector. No, you're not going to go to private sector because what happens is landlords in the private sector are putting their rental prices up to pay their mortgages. That's what Let they're worried about. The rental, right. the rental market is so ugly yeah. right now. Yeah. Like I, fighting. I, people are fighting for their lives for yeah. houses. Even me, I, when I was when I was looking to move out of uh, Luton to move into London, yeah. I found that literally I would buy a house. I would look for a house mm. in um, on a Tuesday. Mm. By Wednesday, I was, and I'll set up a, a, a viewing. By Wednesday, it's gone. Yeah. That happened to me six, seven, six, seven times mm. to the point where the house that I currently looked at now, the day it came onto market, I put my deposit in. I didn't even see the house. Mm. Did not even go for a viewing mm. because it was that bad. I knew by the next day that house was going to be gone. Mm. People are struggling to yeah. find housing right now. And of course, what does that mean? If there's mm. a shortage on houses, there is going to be an increase on rent. Yeah. And what happens when there's an increase on rent and the... And the, the um, the salaries are being uh, staying the same. Mm. It's going to be difficult for people. And unaffordable. To, oh, it's going to be unaffordable. So it's where do people go? Where do we go? Social, social housing. housing. Now, what's with social housing? A million people on the waiting list. You're and you think you're getting into social housing anytime soon? It's not going to happen. That's why I say housing works in a cycle. And at the moment, yeah. it's very, very broken. I mean, you look at the private sector, like you say. There's people fighting each other in order to get a rental property. You've yeah. got landlords turning around and saying, "Yeah, I know you can give the asking price." Or for a two bedroom of three thousand pounds per month. I know you can give that, but there's about twenty eight other people that's emailed us saying they could do the same. Um, so now what we want you to do is all twenty eight of you fight amongst yourself to see who can pay the most per month, and we'll take the highest bidder. That's what's happening. We've got a bidding system in the the, the private rental se uh, sector, which I think is absolutely a disgrace. Yeah. It shows that even that part of the sector is broken as it is, and there needs to be better regulation. But if we've not got regulation, I mean, Liz Truss turned around before she was elected and said, oh, we need to reduce the amount of regulation um, happening in the housing sector. I'm thinking, but there is none. There if you've done none. your research, you would have seen that there's barely any. What do you mean, yeah. reduce regulation? This is a car crash as it is. The housing sector is on its knees. And the day they will learn is when the, com the market completely crashes or the house price crash. They will then learn because they will see how much or how important um, social housing is, but also the private sector too. And, and how they both and those co rented. co-inherently work it, That's it. Together, and how yeah. it works as a cycle. As a cycle. They will see and learn what a problem is then. They think they've got a problem now, but things, if it's allowed to continue in the way it is, I'm sad to say like we are, and it's going to be us tenants suffering. It's going to be tenants yeah. suffering. And we, we say it can't get any worse. I promise you it can. And it's going to happen sooner than people realise if the, this government if doesn't get no a grip. there's no change, that's yeah. It. Honestly, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Before, you, before we close up, I want to ask you mm. a question. Mm -hmm. Who are the people that are currently inspiring you mm. in, your, in your space? Inspiring me in my space? I think anyone really talking about social issues, there's a lot of young people on mm -hmm. social media talking about housing, poor housing, and loads of different social issues. Um, someone really very, very close to me called Sarah, who I'm very good friends with. And then she actually worked with me. She's a journalist and Amazing. she worked with me on the housing story. Yeah. And we are ever since have been really, really good friends. And she supported me from the get go with everything that I do. Um, she really pushed me and wants me to do well with it. Um, and she didn't have to. She didn't have to. She'd done her job and could have just left it there and then. But she chose not to. Um, and there's there's loads of people. Got my friends. Got my close friends. Got my close family. 
Um, but anyone really talking about real issues and, and, and the things that affect people's lives the most, the most important issues, social issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I look up to groups like Grandfell United, Shelter, other campaigners out there, Acorn, really trying to push this agenda of needing better housing in this country. Because like I said, it's the sixth richest economy um, mm -hmm. in the world. They collected 716 billion pounds last year in, in taxes, yet we've got people living in raw sewage and slum conditions. Shouldn't have to, we've got a problem on our hands. And I want to finish by saying not all MPs are bad, I have to say. Yeah. There are out there, there's loads out there that do genuinely care, but if the people at the top and the ones in control don't care enough, then it doesn't matter what they're saying, they're screaming at a brick wall um, too. And to the MPs that aren't doing enough, they need to pull their finger out because if, and I say this all the time, you as an elected MP were elected by the people in order to keep them safe and do what it is. You're a public servant. You need to do what it is that is beneficial to them. They should be your number one priority. Now, if you're not willing to do that, but you're collecting £84,000 plus of taxpayers' money to pay you every single year, wow. not including expenses, and you're sat in the most powerful seat in the country and you're not willing to speak up on their behalf, then you need to leave your seat. Mm -hmm. You need to stop receiving our taxpayers' money and you need to give your your position to someone that does give a damn and someone that wants to create yeah. change. Because there's loads of people in a queue behind you willing to do that and ready to do that. We need people that genuinely care in this country and not just say they are or give token gestures. We don't care for token yeah. gestures. We want actions real impact. speak louder than words. And right now, we're looking for actions. Absolutely. And final thing, mm. to all the people who are watching, yes. what can they do to make black history to make black history just know that your voice matters i think mm -hmm. i think just know that your voice matters know that um it doesn't matter what social issue you're talking about it doesn't have to be housing there's so many social issues you know because you're living it you know what's affecting you you know what you're struggling with you know what your parents struggled with and you could be that person out there speaking up about it, it doesn't matter it, it, it could just be sending an email to someone and getting change in that way. You don't have to be out there screaming and shouting or protesting. It'll be great. We need more of people like that. We need someone to shout. We shouts. really, really do. Yeah. But just be great at whatever it is that you put your mind to and believe in your voice because your voice matters. Just like I said, in Westminster, your voice is as equal as anyone sat in there. Yeah. And it matters just as much. And yes, you might have to scream and shout and you might be on a back foot, but you can get to wherever it is that you want to and have your voice hurt. Just be a massive pain in the ass. That's what you need to be. And like I said earlier, what did I say earlier now? I said, um, um, my attitude's always been, yeah, that's what I said earlier. My attitude's always been fuck around and find out. And I think we need more people off the estates, working class backgrounds, people out there, anyone with that sort of attitude, whether it's against a corporation or individual, um, you know the difference between right and wrong, ultimately. And what we're looking for is right and the right Fuck thing. around and find out. That's it. That's, that's the title. That's, that's the, the title. title. That's, Fuck around that's and it. find out. That's it. Thank you, Quaja, so much thank for you coming. For Guys, it has it. been Quaja Housing, honestly. Thank you thank so you. much for coming. You are inspiration to me and to a lot of people. Mm. And I cannot wait for people to watch this and to hear your story man thank you thank you and congratulations on your award too big yes! up yourself big honestly up yourself. we mentioned it we mentioned it in the title you yeah. are a three-time wow. award winning social media activist mm. and it's been an honor but yes thank, thank you. you so big much we yourself. were there yes yes. Yeah. yes thank you i'm happy mm. god is good and i'm glad that god is giving us voices and platforms to do and say the right things mm. not just for us mm. but for our communities as well That's so thank it. you so much thank guys you. this has been cnt presents making black history i have been your host madam joyce and thank you guys for motherfucking watching